We are live. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Maisel Beck, and I am super happy to welcome you all to our fourth talk of the series, Screaming, Screening Screaming, Human Nature in Crisis, in collaboration with our partners, uh, the Bombay Institute for Critical Analysis and Research, BICAR. To everyone joining us after a big celebration, happy Diwali. Uh, today, we're going to hear from Methal Mazroui, who is a current PhD student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, MIT. Um, Metha is also one third of the trio that curated the current exhibition at Warehouse 421, titled On Foraging, uh, Food Knowledge and Environmental Imaginaries in the UAE's Landscape. She also is one of the three curators who edited the book, the accompanying publication to the uh, exhibition. What I'll do is I'll, I'll kick off the talk by just introducing our incredible discussant, Pari Bardana Mohanty, and then I'll leave it to you, Pari, uh, to take it forward, speak a little bit about Metha, and then uh, we'll take it from there. So Pari Bartana Mohanty is a visual artist and storyteller based in Delhi. He's currently, of course, taking part in our curatorial development uh, exhibition program. Um, and Perry has quite the list of accolades and experiences in his resume. So I'm going to list a very, very small percentage of them. They include a nomination for Asia's leading award for media artists, the fourth VH award and online residency at iBeam. He took part in SOMA summer program in Mexico in the highly competitive studio residency program at uh, Skowhegan, New York. And he was a visiting uh, artist fellow at South Asia Institute, Harvard University, Boston. Just a few of the incredible things that uh, Pari has been involved in. In our curatorial development program, Pari Bartana's project tries to understand the representation of deteriorating environment condition in the, specifically in the Indian state of Odisha through subjective approaches, mediums, and technologies used by young artists and locals. The project explores the scenic, the sublime, the seductive, the grotesque, and the cruel view of nature as technology mediated by products that may overpower human imagination and knowledge. That was a little bit from Pari's uh, description of the project. And with that, I'll leave it to you. Thank you, Miss. Uh, I'm super nervous because I've never moderated any talk before. <laughs> this is my first moderation, international, that's also international. And uh, my English is not that good, so be please be with me. Uh, I have a paragraph to read. Uh, that's the introduction. Uh, so, and the format is we'll have the talk, uh, then we'll have a five minute break, and then the question answer. So, Metha. Alma Zuri is a current PhD student in history, theory, and criticism of architecture at MIT. She received her MS in critical, curatorial, and conceptual practices in architecture from Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation. Her curatorial and editorial work encompassed public programming from Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, publication for the National Pavilion of the United Arab Emirates in Venice, and establishing TWD magazine and architecture and design publication in two, 2012 as a platform to collect urban narratives from the Arabian Gulf, Eastern Mediterranean, and North Africa. So this is a small introduction. And now I, I want to invite Meta to present a paper. Uh, she has a illustrious uh, PPT or PDF to present. So, We'll be hearing now from Meta. Thank you so much, uh, Parmi and Mace. Uh, Mace and Rohit for inviting me to speak today. I'll share my presentation. Um, I hope you can all see the screen. Okay. Uh, all right, great. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Meta, and today I'll be presenting four moments from the history of scent. Um, it's a topic that I've been consumed by, and um, it's also my PhD dissertation that I've been weeding through for a while now with the help of advisors, colleagues, and 
uh, exceptional friends, two of who I'd like to single out today, uh, Omar Abdel Ghaffar and uh, Nadi Busaada for helping me frame it in the format that uh, I'll be sharing today. Um, I'll start with a 13th century recipe, uh, dry a wolf's penis and pound it, then mix it with musk, cloves and saffron of pure filaments. That is my advice should you sense the need for supplementary aid. Make sure to prepare it yourself, the scent will help. Swallow the compacted powder before the sun sets, said Ibn al-Jazar, the renowned physician, or was he a perfumer? The formula was for an anonymous woman searching for a recipe to help her conceive. For a headache, he asked her if she had any rose water. If that was too expensive or unavailable, olive oil or, uh, or warm water would do. Ibn al-Jazar combined such fragrant recipes in a book titled Tabb al-Faqara wal Masakin, translated as Medicine for the Poor and Destitute. Uh, Al-Jazar's customized recommendation exemplifies how the content and ingredients of recipes are adapted to reflect the purchasing power um, and abilities of the intended audience. The compendium he produced was one of many during that period uh, that were either inspired by or directly translated from the herbal remedies listed in Dioscorides Materia Medica, written initially in third century Greek. The earliest iteration you could see on the left here on the screen uh, was a commission by um, Anisia Juliana as a book of remedies, possibly for a woman's ailments. Um, it was originally written in Greek. Uh, the first Arabic translation that you see in the center or one of the first Arabic translations were made in uh, Baghdad in the eighth century. Um, after which the work spread uh, throughout the Islamic world, laying the foundation for the study of botany and pharmacology um, in West Asia. The Arabic versions of Dioscorides texts provided the basis of, for translations into Latin, Persian, and Armenian. Um, in translating these recipes from the original Greek, to multiple editions of Syriac, Arabic, and Persian, and back again to Latin, uh, the method charged each iteration of the document with local ingredients uh, and tastes, which allowed the knowledge to enter different um, epistemic communities. Um, additions to the text uh, and to the recipes were inscribed in different handwriting, often and often with various ink along the margins. The, Fluidity of the professions um, is also reflected in the Arabic language, where the root meaning of the term tabib uh, comes from fragrance, which is tab. And uh, poison in medicine, da wa dawa, uh, share the same root. So you can imagine that um, a pharmacist would sell you perfume while the perfumer could be summoned to heal your ailments. Uh, pharmacy and pharmacists, Saidala and Attar, uh, connote sellers of sandalwood. Uh, or fragrance, indicating the overlap between substances used for perfume or cooking and medieval uh, medicine. Uh, thus, it's important to note that there wasn't a distinction between incense, food, poison, and medicine either, um, as they were all iterations of the same category, where too much medicine becomes poison um, all materials used in the formulas have specific qualities associated with them, and when produced, enact uh, particular spatial qualities. Meanwhile, the knowledge of how they could be uh, enacted moved through society via bodies that carried the information and uh, material objects that consolidated the knowledge. Um, but the question of scent uh, for a historian is difficult because it's a temporal material that evaporated or, or was consumed and thus the labor implied in the production was often invisible as well. Um, however, in my work, I plan to examine the economy of fragrance in the medieval Islamic world and spatialize the role of scent um, in architecture specifically. Um, I hope to do this by tracing the genealogy of book production in Baghdad and the larger territory in the 13th century. Um, the dissemination 
of medicinal formularies was at a peak during the Abbasid period. Um, and this is as early as the eighth uh, century. Um, and I would like to argue that we cannot understand um, these books or Abbasid life, uh, social life without considering the central role that scent played in the production of culture. Um, therefore, I'd like to show how multiple rewriting and translation uh, of documents could begin to reveal a dormant historical narrative that revolved uh, in and around uh, what was a very dynamic industry. The geography examined in my research refers um, to the multiple sites in which the recipes were either translated or rewritten. And I propose to contain the research or the site uh, between the Persian or Arabian Gulf and the Red Sea um, and bounded by Iraq in the north and Yemen in the south. Uh, the recipes that I'm looking at are part of a large material corpus, uh, specifically manuscripts that are classified under Materia Medica, uh, books on poison um, and medical encyclopedias. These include uh, and are not really limited to uh, the multiple versions of Ibn al-Mahdi's book of fragrance, Kitab al-Tib, Misawiya's The Specialty of Medicine, uh, Kitab Jawahar al-Tib, and Al-Kindi's Perfumery Instructions, Kitab Kimya al um, and al Nawari's The Ultimate Ambition and the Arts of Erudition, uh, Dioscorid Materia Medica, Al-Qabzini's Wonders of Creation, and uh, Ibn al-Wahshiya's book on poison. Um, and because my work kind of borrows from a material, social, and intellectual history, um, my research methodology uh, requires multiple modes of analysis. Um, I use the visual, um, textual, and a method of mapping, um, which I'll elaborate on further or later in the presentation. Um, in Islamic art history, the approach of looking at manuscripts only for their illustration is one that prevails. Uh, the gulf between textual historians and illustrative traditions remain largely unabridged. Um, Eva Hoffman um, is an Islamic art historian who writes on the beginnings of the illustrated Arabic book uh, and portable objects. And she attempts to bridge that gap. She does that. Uh, and I build on her work uh, a lot, uh, specifically her method of understanding the transmission of art in medieval period as what she's quoted as um, an interactive space of translation. And what she means by interactive space of translation is that often spaces on the page uh, during the translation process were left empty and framed by text waiting to be filled. Uh, if an ingredient, for example, was not recognized locally um, or was not recognized by name or illustration, its name was transliterated uh, in the hopes that a future author would be able to recognize it. Um, illustrations were also translated. No two documents carry the exact visual representation. Um, furthermore, these site-specific uh, Translations demonstrate how recipe flowed, again, like I mentioned earlier, through uh, social structures uh, due to experimentation, while retaining the aura of healing with and through fragrance. Uh, using this method of analysis, the surface of the page serves as an archive, uh, preserving layers of textual and visual interactions uh, that contributed to the process of transmission of knowledge. And uh, the evidence of archiving of the margins, as you see here and in numerous pages, uh, confirms that these manuscripts were used and demonstrates how they were read. Um, the recipe, for instance, could have been intended as a record uh, to simply instruct or consolidate this knowledge, or um, it could have been that a pharmacist or a perfumer um, would be able to prepare the formula or treat a patient on the spot using uh, these lists. Oops. Um, so the first moment uh, recipe as 
fragrance uh, that I'll present today will look at uh, ingredients, tools, and the spaces of production. Uh, sent the second moment um, looks at uh, gender, labor, and how recipes interact with society at large. Um, and this could be the actors uh, making the formulas and the individuals uh, interacting with them. The third moment looks at the Abbasid geography uh, or landscape and the larger network uh, of circulation, highlighting the broader trades and regionalism. Uh, the fourth and final moment that I would like to foreground here is um, the different journeys that these documents have taken since and the archival processes associated with them. Uh, so this section builds on provenance studies and asks what happens to the epistemology of a book uh, when it's dispersed. Um, the page of the recipe book does a lot for me um, in the first moment when trying to reveal ingredients, tools, and spaces of production. At a first glance, um, the page contains a list of ingredients. Scent is invisible in its materiality, but at a close reading, the page brings scent to life. The corpus of Materia Medica provides vivid and detailed spatial descriptions of architectural typologies, agricultural sites, and storage spaces. Um, for example, like what can we deduce from the page that's on the screen now? Um, it's a recipe titled Preparing Medicine from Honey. Um, it's currently displayed at the Met uh, as a single folio. Um, and it reads, to whom has no appetite or is feeling weak, the description is as follows. Take one part honey and in the margin, one part tears. Mix with honey and cook in a pot until two thirds of it is gone, then take it out of the pot. Uh, as you can see here, the vignettes um, organized in a grid tells a different part of the story. Um, in the center of the page, uh, a pharmacist or a perfumer is illustrated. Um, he holds a vessel while stirring the boiling honey and water as he prepares to hand it uh, to the seated male figure. On the second floor, um, on either side of a row of containers, um, a figure on the left drinks uh, from a glass beaker and one on the right kneels while stirring a pot. The architectural setting suggests that the formula is being prepared in a kitchen. Here, um, the page can be perceived as portable architecture. Whether depicting a space or a vessel, the document allows architectural representation to move across geographic uh, and social space. All the while, uh, architectural representation here also demonstrates the fluidity of spatializing disciplines um, as kitchen, pharmacy, or lab. The second moment reveals how scent prevailed in society by identifying labor, gender, and patronage. Um, it also points at the means by which bodies are used as a tool of measurement. Uh, the questions that surfaced for me here were what practical knowledge survived through distance when these books were carried, moved, um, or housed in their translation sort of processes. Um, how were disciplines delineated? And what were women's roles in this production of knowledge? Um, and I say this because um, raw materials had to be cleaned, they had to be dried, they had to be soaked, um, all before they were cooked. This, uh, the laborious process of preparing the ingredients uh, was left out of the page. They're listed as final in their final element. Um, and it was, I'm sure, a, uh, a strenuous task and the smoke exuded uh, could have been harmful to the body over time. And as some of the ingredients were precious, not all members of society handled them. Um, in the and also in the visual illustrations, only men were depicted handling the ingredients. Um, and the, the text takes on uh, a masculine plural, which is a default 
plural. Um, but where were the women? The provenance shows that many were patrons, um, yet women are rarely represented in these documents, even when the recipe is directly uh, prescribed to them. The, again, as I mentioned before, in the marginalia implies that communication with the pharmacist did occur, as surely women had to test uh, the recipes prescribed to them um, and also the ones catered to their extended families. Um, here, the individuals testing the re uh, recipes manifest as marginalia serving as annotations uh, rather than recollections of events occurring. Um, this leads me to the third moment uh, that alludes to the landscape, uh, network, and provenance. Um, El Kindi's uh, perfumery compendium uh, mentions that sites of preparation, the types of vessels used, and where the ingredients were sourced explicitly. Um, in a recipe for aromatic pills, for example, uh, he, the author lists Javanese aloes wood, uh, melons from Khurasan as essential ingredients to be spread uh, in a porcelain bowl. Um, and then left to dry under a mahabba, uh, which was a type of uh, breeze catcher or a shaft with built-in walls um, for ventilation and to decrease uh, indoor temperatures as well. Uh, the ingredients he mentions are foreign to the Abbasid region and the indication of a porcelain bowl here is essential um, as it's a material that doesn't absorb scent. Uh, it's not porous. The textual corpus, again, the textual corpus that I'm looking at uh, does not mention the infrastructure and the method of transportation or transporting the materials. Um, however, the question that I'm posing is how can I work around the limitations of the textual evidence? Um, I can fall back on archaeology and other ceramics and trade product discourses um, that are prominent. Uh, However, I think the text opens new possibilities for looking at mapping. Um, and I would like to experiment to see uh, in the next couple of months um, if I could extract all the sites that are mentioned in the documents and use tools from the digital humanities uh, to map them. It would be interesting to compare where the sites land on existing visualizations of trade networks. Um, and I hope that this process can reveal new regions or new agricultural sites, um, not new perhaps, but like highlight um, agricultural sites that don't fall so neatly um, onto archaeological trade routes and roads that um, we've come to sort of take as like solid, um, uh, as a solid network or as given. The diagram, on the other hand, that's projected on the screen was an exercise for me to start vis visualizing the expanse of the network. And uh, for now, there are just dots that situate the sites of book production and sites of translation relative to the agricultural sites um, and trade ports as well, uh, or trade cities and port cities. Uh, I hope to build on that and produce a reading of a larger constellation of moving bodies and objects. The fourth moment captures the state of the documents today, uh, which focuses on where the recipes have landed and how they circulate in contemporary society, um, and ultimately how, I, I, how I've been able to access uh, these documents or how other scholars uh, or where other scholars access these documents. Um, it's a historiographic exercise where the overarching questions um, I'd like to raise are what does it mean to house a recipe and what does it mean to read a recipe today? Uh, what happens to the book when it's separated? And also who is the assumed audience when uh, of these documents when the image is prioritized over the text or over the textual script. These, uh, the images or the scans that you see on the screen 
um, are the intricately illustrated documents containing figures and elaborate details commissioned by prominent uh, societal members uh, within a very privileged medieval social strata. Um, I'd like to argue that these um, social structures are still embedded within the pages of the documents uh, today. And um, the text here is not necessarily conditioned to the illustrations and alternatively could have been a reflection of the milieu in which they were produced. The governing Abbasid empire uh, ruled over the northern uh, part of the territory and the de depiction of an extravagant court life uh, could have been how they wanted to be framed. The page here becomes a medium that presents a narrative in the form of everyday life that was common to that strata of society or just simply a reflection of popular culture. Uh, the pages of the book, um, of the illustrated books are sold at auctions um, and are treated as individual works of art. Uh, so they're now collectible and exhibited as single folios, uh, not in sequence uh, of the original compendium. And they're hard to map, um, map back, up, uh, back together or sort of reconstruct a sequence of how these books were produced. Um, and they're archived in museums such as the Smithsonian Institution, British Museum, Welcome Collection, and the Met. Um, and alternatively, the more utilitarian documents uh, that were used by perfumers and pharmacists and, and possibly were, were circulated uh, among a wider public are treated very differently. Um, as they're currently housed in public libraries, uh, such as the British Library and the Bibliothèque Nationale and, uh, and numerous digital archives um, as compendiums, as full compendiums. In conclusion, um, so far the history of architecture has treated sent as this phenomenological a component, and in my work, I'd like to affirm sense materiality as it was not solely an ephemeral substance, uh, but one that's a result of material extraction, labor, and was deployed with intention uh, within medieval spaces. Uh, I hope that my presentation illustrated that knowledge production was not the work of individuals, but was inevitably social. Uh, perfumers, instrument makers, and technicians have tended uh, to be invisible actors in the production of knowledge because generally speaking, our modern culture doesn't credit the methods in which they engage, as, uh, which they engage in as knowledge making. Um, there is textual evidence that such individuals saw things very differently. Uh, they carved out spaces where they could engage in scientific activities on their own terms and construct alternative representations of scientific authority. Uh, their relative in invisibility of such instrumental knowledge is a historical construct. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll stop the share. Thank you. Uh, this is super pleasant. Like very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, just came to my mind, but are we going to have it a gap or should we continue? What do you think, Maitra? Uh, up to you. If, if people want a five minute break, uh, we can do that or we can keep it rolling as you wish. I'm happy either way. Uh, Rohit? I don't mind, like, I want to continue because this is exciting. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I, think, I think that we should continue. Sorry, I'm in a uh, yeah. terribly audio-deprived uh, place, Beta, but thank you for that. But yes, I think we can continue because we have, uh, you know, we, we can seamlessly move from it. So go ahead, if that's okay with Beta and Lou Parry. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, so uh, I'll keep the floor open so anybody can interrupt and ask questions or whatever uh, points or suggestions, whatever you have in your mind uh, for the audience. But I, I, I want to start with this idea, like uh, um, when I was reading your concept note, it was mentioned scent, then 
uh, this recipe. So I was like continuously keep thinking about the food, uh, food what which you eat. So here recipe is like you cook something which you can sl- uh, smell. And first time in my experience of looking at somebody's work, I constantly thinking like if I'm able to hear, able to smell the um, uh, pages or smell the landscape you showed. So for me, it was not a visual interpretation. It was more like smelling all these landscapes and all. And uh, and I was just reminded by this writer. I don't know if you, have, if you know, Deepak Unikrishnan. He wrote a book on, uh, called Temporary People. And he talks yeah. about this, a uh, lot of Indians, uh, they uh, go to Middle East to work. So there's a chapter which talks about the smell of the body in the mm-hmm. airplane. And due to the AC, uh, you know, air condition, that kind of uh, enhanced the smell. So mm-hmm. we, when you were talking about architecture, uh, it's more about light and air and ventilation and all, no? because that kind of create that, I think. With uh, mm-hmm. aeroplane as a body, I was just thinking about that. We're not connected to your talk, but about this enhancement of the smell and the labor's mm-hmm. body, uh, I think. Uh, and uh, while I was looking at this uh, manuscripts, uh, illustrations, it mm-hmm. was not, for me, it was not like book, as if you went to read those texts. It was for me like a map. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I could not read whatever it is written. So for mm-hmm. me, it was a map uh, of a place where I've never been. Because, mm-hmm. uh, because of that eligibility of the language, I don't read, right. so I don't, uh, I've never been to that place. So that was also another thing. And then I was thinking, uh, there is one page you showed where text and they left the space for the drawing. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a concept in uh, France called horror vacui. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's the idea which uh, early cartographers, French cartographers, they used in map making. So in the beginning, when people travel uh, the world and they make maps, there are mm-hmm. places they could not discover. And uh, mm-hmm. so that place was left empty. And mm-hmm. in those places, they put flora and fauna and wild animals and scary things. So when we were showing those empty uh, space and the text, as if this map is waiting for this horror vacuum, you know, the, to fill that mm-hmm. empty void, some kind of, so both are complementing the image and the text. Um, so these are like random thoughts to like came to my mind. And, uh, but yeah, like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I have no knowledge about, you think I just, I feel like when I read the concept, I was just thinking like, I mean, Delhi and it's so super polluted, it keeps smelling that, you know, this yeah. you call the smoke of the firecracker. Then we are talking, yeah. like I have my door, everything shut and I'm talking with perfume. So please you talk, mm-hmm. then we, I want to hear uh, more. And, and yeah, one, I mean, like, one last point. Sure, if you can read ahead. some some text from some image, because I am very curious what is written there, the page. Uh, sure, yeah. I can definitely do that. And... Um, I read the one of uh, the honey, the one where honey is distilled from water, but I'm happy that the texts were able or the presentation was able to evoke scent because I think it's the hardest, um, um, like it's hard to do that online. It's hard to do that in person, even when we're presenting. And uh, what, I mean, I guess it's also fascinating that you were able to pick up on the other world or the projection of another world through these landscapes, because I think a lot of the Abbasid uh, commissions were to try and understand the rest of the world. So initially, um, the first or one of the first caliphs in Mansur uh, was the one who started this entire translation movement in uh, Baghdad by sending scholars to uh, to translate uh, Greek philosophy specifically and astrological documents. And through that, uh, the Galenic medical uh, documents be- were translated. But it was also, but he also commissioned a lot of uh, translations from Sanskrit and Persian books. But because of uh, the elements of uh, Arabic, the Galenic school focuses on four elements, uh, which is water, fire, 
uh, air and what kind of, and earth. Um, whereas the Sanskrit included five, which is ether or the other like space, uh, which didn't fit so neatly with uh, the monotheistic Islamic um, um, beliefs. So there, I mean, the translation didn't go one way is what I'm trying to say that there were books um, and they're hard to map because a lot of the Persian and Sanskrit books aren't available. Uh, so you can't make direct links specifically, but it's obvious um, um, in the textual evidence. Uh, but yeah, we can open the floor to other questions, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, anybody want to come in? Rohit, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry if you hear like lots of uh, dog shouting and, and chaos. It's Diwali, as Mace had mentioned. And so there, and as Pari Bartana just mentioned, Mace, there are firecrackers constantly. And my house of pets has gone, has gone, has gone terrified and absolutely not. So I'm going to try and get this in very quickly. But thanks very much for that. Um, it was great. Uh, the project really gets me thinking quite differently. Um, you know, I think everyone, as Pari was saying too, in his comments, um, and it's, it's it's really wonderful research work. It's it's not easy to do to do what you're doing, you know. Um, and so that's, it's it's really creative and, and great methodologically as well. So thanks. Um, I wanted to ask uh, a, a more generic question, or perhaps two. One is um, this sort of uh, uh, this this notion, of course, that you're seeing. I think it's quite interesting that I had no idea about, but of you know, sort of scent as uh, perfume or or or, or, or um, a community of 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 um, sort of an infection of pleasure, right? Uh, of a glue of maybe sociality or love or whatever, um, and then it as as poison, as homeopathic um, of sorts as well. So this sort of community community and immunity paradigm, you know, that sort of runs certainly through the history of modernity. You know, um, if like Agamben and and um, you know his lesser known. Um, uh, but, uh, well, anyway, yes, if they're to believe, I mean, that, you know, this, this classic question of, of the pharmacon, you know, of, of, you know, the double-edged sword, right? How, how to, how to, how to ensure that community isn't overtaken by immunity, right? Like how to ensure that like the child is actually going to grow up, um, uh, you know, and not get shot, um, or, or sick or die, um, uh, you know, but at the same time, we're not going to suffocate that child by like locking it up in a room for its entire life to to, to make sure its immunity is, is 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 there. So, this is a really impossible ask, I think. But um, this classic question of how much is there's no measure, it doesn't seem like between the scent as perfume and the scent as homeopathy, right? So, if there isn't a measure, right, or a balance or a homeostasis, or maybe there is in the literature that you're or the, the the archives that you're looking at. Do you have any thoughts just from this really fresh material you're considering on how to address this seeming um, paradox of the community immunity problem? Because you're looking at medieval texts, which as well, mm -hmm. which is, 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 is very pre-modern. So um, yeah, that's sort of, that's, that's my gen, my, that's my question, guess, uh, which is not a great one, but uh, if you no, can share some thoughts. Uh, no, thank you, Rohit, for your question. Um, if I understood it correctly, um, there, so the only document that I had seen so far that explicitly categorizes scent um, as its own category is in Ibn al-Wahshiya's book on poison, where the chapters are uh, divided in um, how you can transfer scent through your senses and uh, how you can transfer poison. Uh, through touch or uh, or taste and scent as a category. And what I thought was also interesting in the books of poison is that they would list um, the different sort of recipes, but would also have the antidotes um, that would sit adjacent to the recipe. Um, and time here was a factor that um, was also that played a role in the transfer or played a role in the exchange and not just the production process where 
um, I, and I think it's also to not trace um, the person sort of enacting the poison to to themselves or to their bodies. Um, so it would, there were some recipes that would um, it would take I don't know a week to poison the individual or a month, um, and that duration um, played a huge role. But otherwise, I think um, in terms of immunity and like social, um, uh, sorry, I'm distracted by a question was uh, placed on, uh, sent in the text or in the chat. Um, the, yeah, where was I? In, in, I, we're talking I, about immunity, immunity. No, 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 that's, immunity, I think you're, yes. you're, you're right. So, um, so, immunity so. was more of, I think most of the, you, I mean, you're making me think of like, sort of sift through uh, the patterns that I've found, but there are usually external factors uh, that occur in the body. So if it was like a lot of the recipes address snake bites, for example, or scorpion bites and uh, like hazar hazardous factors that the environment sort of inflicts on the body, but also hygiene and uh, self-care were part of these recipes. Like there was, there weren't really organized with a particular hierarchy, especially dice, um, especially Dioscordi's Materia Medica, where the chapters are, uh, or the pages are organized by type of ingredient. So it's everything that you could do with this one ingredient. Um, and I think I saw another hand being raised. I think it was Ritika, but I- It was Ritika, but before that, uh, there is someone uh, posted on YouTube, Lubna yes. Mobet, uh, she said, she or he, I don't know, she said, this was so rich. Thank you very much. Uh, her question is, you mentioned researching the involvement of women. Can you tell us more about that? Then uh, Moza also wrote something in the Zoom. Yeah, I'm reading Moza's in the script now. Um, to answer Lubna's uh, question. Yes, I can talk more about the women. Um, I mentioned briefly that one of the very first iterations of the book was commissioned uh, by a woman to sort of address um, different types of ailments. So I think that if that document has been translated and copied and, and edited, the, the initial sort of knowledge of um, producing these recipes for a female body can retain will retain over time, um, depending on who is um, or what type of body is addressed or what types of ailments are addressed. Um, there's a lot on conception and birthing and um, sp particular rituals around that that again. Uh, are brought by um, are brought by women and I and for the documents that have edits and um, are of different iterations I would assume that there is a conversation between the pharmacist and uh, women in society who would go back and uh, you know sort of respond to a, a recipe that works or if it didn't work or uh, what made it work? What what are those edits? What are those slight sort of uh, application methods? Um, and I think it builds uh, at the point where I close at that it's a conversation. It's a conversation between like the production of the scientific knowledge was a conversation between different members of society that came back and it circulated and was edited, was tweaked uh, as the book moved more north or more south or uh, depending on the region, ingredients were replaced, um, methods were were edited out and uh, um, sh and women played a huge role in, in that. So I hope I addressed Lubna's question or was able to paint a larger sort of picture on the role. Um, yeah, I think uh, Rico also had a question. Rico, um, Rico, you want to go next? Uh, hi. Yes, uh, I do. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, um, 
Uh, thank you for that really, really fascinating material. I, I have a little story to tell you. Um, so uh, I'm talking to you from Beirut, right? So uh, when I first arrived here, um, and I'd come having, having spent a lot of time in the West, uh, I arrived here and um, I went to Cairo for a trip just after I arrived here. And um, uh, I was wandering through the bazaar one day and there were a whole lot of different herbs um, for, for, as infusions for teas, right? So I, I bought a whole lot of them. Uh, and I came back and I gave this, I gave little packets of them to a friend of mine who was around my age, so not young, right? And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, each packet that I gave her, I said, and, and this is a tea. And she said, uh, a, a yes, what's it for? And I said, uh, it's tea. And she said, yes, but what's it for? And we kept on going around in circles until I kind of began to, understood that, I began to understand that for her, there's no such thing as tea. There's no such thing as a herb that you put into your body. Every single thing has an effect on your body and is effectively is already a medicine in some way. So you drink this tea when you have an upset stomach, you see you have this tea when you have a headache, you have this tea and it'll help you see better. Um, and um, so the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because it took me some time to get my head around this idea of, you know, this, this kind of idea of neutral food, you know, that, that you're just gonna, that, that you eat because it tastes good. And um, the, the reason that I'm saying this to you, this doesn't have necessarily to do with, uh, with scent, but it has got to do with this notion of um, this kind of medieval conception that you're working with, which is of herbs that, you know, herbs have this, implicitly have this effect on your body. And it's quite difficult to, to get people in this day and age, certainly in the West, to, to grasp, you know, I was sensitive to this and it still took me 10 minutes to, to, know, what she was, to know what she was talking about. So um, I, I think that's an interesting aspect for you to, I, that I think might be necessary to foreground right, right from the beginning uh, is this is a whole different way of thinking about ingestion and a whole different way of thinking about food. And then once you, or, 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 I keep on saying food, but that's not the right thing, right? It's whatever you take into your body and you can take it in by mouth or obviously, you know, what could be more potent in some ways, more potent even than food or taste is smell, which it has to do with this. You were talking about the Galenic elements, right? Of uh, this kind of essence of something, right? A smell in some ways is much more powerful than something that you put into your body because it's got this kind of etherized, uh, 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 purified, um, essential quality. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just a, just a comment uh, of, of, of how a general way to kind of approach this material or how to present the material in a, in a sense. Thanks. Thank you, Rico. Um, Ritika, Moza, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, I wanted, I wanted to go back to Moses' question because um, she asked um, how, lands, how when landscapes are presented, they're displayed through tangible or visual material. And I'm fascinated how scent is able to display histories and landscapes when the body that's absorbing it is somehow removed um, from those timelines. And um, maybe I can say a little bit more yes. about that. I think Sorry. One time, um, <laughs> I hear your talk, and I and I um, the way that it's been super effective for me, obviously, is hearing you talk about it and 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 read um, your text as well. And I think there's something um, really powerful in the way that, that that is presented too, in in kind of you also as this uh, recording device that is able to be in, in time and space in real time, uh, kind of um, relaying that knowledge. Um, and yeah, I was, I'm, I'm quite fascinated with like how that stands with, you know, how, how maybe with the sense themselves being um, um, perpetuated, I suppose, uh, as well, and how you really see how that can be contained in space other than writing and, and, and speaking. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were different ways that uh, the language of scents or fragrance or the olfactory comes into play. Um, and I could give you different examples off of the top of my head where um, there are some recipes for that are more obvious. So they're, they're meant to be perfume or they're meant to evoke um, sensual 
um, air, which is uh, particular caliphs had specific soaps and these bar soaps that were made for them, uh, the recipes list uh, particular ingredients that were either sort of uh, presented that they came from other lands and were therefore valued and expensive um, or just valued or precious. And they would also distinguish them by color. So a certain caliph would have um, a more sort of, I don't know the colors off the top of my head, but like you can imagine like different sort of infused um, bar soaps. And then there's there are other uh, sort of senses evoked in food as well, where in the Book of Poison, um, Ibn al-Wahshiya, claims that one of the antidotes to um, to knowing if foods uh, had um, had poison in them was that they uh, during a feast the caliphs would have peacocks around and the peacock would smell would be able to smell poison and that was sort of one indication to flag to flag it because there's also like a non-human I guess aspect to um I mean, not, I guess, like to the whole process. So like, and then fragrance is also measured by uh, by taste where I think that's where I fall or it could be very muddy or, uh, or problematic is that the assumption that what we think or we assume is smells good uh, follows the same uh, tastes of Thabasid period. So maybe something that would, I would read as foul was accepted and... <laughs> Um, and considered fragrant. So I think that's where it becomes very murky and po problematic in, uh, in just producing interpretations um, or assuming that uh, certain taste values sort of uh, retained over time. Yeah, uh, Ritika? Hi. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much, Mehta. Um, that was very evocative, kind of, of course, made me think about um, Suskin's novel, um, you know, Perfume, Story of a Murderer, and thinking about sort of erotic and libidinal power and all of these things. Um, but I guess I just kind of wanted to come back to the very opening of your talk, because I was very struck by that sort of initial recipe, right? And thinking about this wolf's penis. Um, and then that kind of got me into thinking about how the animal or parts of the animal perhaps are kind of rendered as ingredient or rendered as material for the scent. Um, and kind of thinking about perhaps these sort of dissections of these parts of animals as no longer bodies, but um, this, the, as ingredients, as these sort of multivalent substances. So I was wondering if you could speak a bit more to the way that the yeah, human usage of scent and economies of scent relate to the non-human um, in this way. Yeah. Um. I didn't look at it in depth per se, but um, the, I mean, ingredients moved and tr I mean, ingredients were valued because of their use. And I think part of the process of, um, of this research is um, I would like to reveal or sort of point out that uh, value was given to a lot of um, not seemingly mundane ingredients were because society had a place or valued it because of its use. And um, I think I can only talk about that and uh, value is produced through different ways. Like value could be the scarcity of the material itself, or it could be the distance uh, in which it comes from the availability within uh, specific economic or uh, or zones, uh, Basra and Baghdad were key um, port city, uh, not port cities, key uh, trade cities. Um, therefore, a lot of material and a lot of um, um, ingredients passed through, even if they were not used or uh, or exchanged or bartered uh, within uh, within those cities within uh, Baghdad and Basra, there were they were passing through to the Mediterranean. Uh, so these routes were quite prominent until, um, 
the decline of the Abbasid Empire and uh, the rise of the Fatimids in Egypt, where the Red Sea then became the sort of the route, the trade routes crossed through the Red Sea. And um, I mean, not that the Red Sea wasn't prominent prior to that or the Indian Ocean trade, uh, but it sort of gave rise to that section or that uh, or that route. Um, and there are indications to value um, within these documents when thinking about the vessels that carried um, a lot of the, not raw ingredients, but sort of either the oils or the pulverized wolf penis or whatever ingredient uh, sort of uh, traveled. And the sea routes uh, sort of produced an air of humidity. So a lot of the precious ingredients still carried through the caravan routes and were not replaced by uh, the prominent sea routes in later centuries. Um, so I think to circle back to your question, the, the value is there, but like consciousness around um, the non-human sort of production was not one that I paid close attention to. Um, Thank you. Uh, Thank you for your okay. question. <laughs> uh, there is someone in the YouTube, uh, Birandana Solanki, she's saying thank you, Meta. I had a question related to scent with memory and how you think of the other senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, eliciting various reading of the same smell of different, spe different people. Um, yeah, exactly. I think the way we uh, retain uh, or react to uh, to scent can differ. And again, that's the problematic of this. These are like the problem points or the pressure points of the research is uh, a blanket assumption can't be made. Um, and uh, the books themselves show that a blanket assumption can't be made because um, measurements are altered, uh, descriptors are altered. Um, and again, a lot of research also kind of points out that these edits might not be practical edits to the material, but the scribe writing uh, or taking down or translating or copying could have just simply made a mistake. Um, so it requires like a close reading of um, of the text, of the script, uh, of the pen, uh, to understand uh, those nuances um, yeah. or those sort of the distinctions. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about that, uh, like you, were, you talk about translations and uh, with translation, we talk about loss of meaning. So here, mm -hmm. do, have you ever tried to make some perfumes which have changed due to translation, the recipe or something? Um, <laughs> I have tried to do a couple of, I mean, a while ago, um, a couple of these um, of the recipes, but only just to see how laborious it is, like to just sit and stir or for hours or uh, to keep sort of ingredients out for a month before you can consume them. Um, like season comes into play, environment comes into play. Um, when you're meant to sort of uh, start a recipe and when it's consumed, there's like a long duration. And um, and that was my intention of sort of trying these recipes out. It was just to sort of understand um, how time comes into play, which I've, I've, kind of, I've sort of just dropped <laughs> from, uh, from trying to even like include that within the research because it's... Um, yeah, it's messy and it's not sound and it's not scientific or precise. So it's, um, I've found that just sticking to the evidence and the material corpus, which is uh, rich and to sort of extract what exists instead of assuming or projecting um, uh, my own reading and biases. I think which Did inevitably- you also is have to... those things? Like, Sorry? Have, you, have you smelled them? You have it? Uh, like because now it's very strange to we are talking about something which like like I now I'm feeling a void 
no like this vacuum of not uh, smelling but we are talking so are this available t- today or like uh, like i have, i have no picture of this like how where it is placed and how it smells uh, i mean i hope they're not being circulated uh, i mean it depends i'm not sure i understand uh, like you are talking about the ways no you are talking about the ways which carried uh, the utensils you know which carried mm-hmm. those things So I'm just wondering, this perfume exists today, or we are talking about something which doesn't exist at all, only through the text and the reading um, material we are talking about it. I mean, there are residues of ingredients that are found in archaeological sites, which even predate this translation movement. Like uh, cinnamon is found in iron jars uh, in Mesopotamia that uh, allude to the Indian Ocean trade, um, and. Uh, even earlier like pepper uh, was found in the archaeological remains of Ramses's nose um, and so there there was a larger trade network and even George Saliba uh, who's a renowned scholar um, in the history of science states that um, translation or trans- the, this translation phenomenon uh, that happened in the Islamic world existed way before the Abbasids um and so there is that sort of context contested um uh, yeah time and frame to to understanding the corpus or the material corpus uh but yeah the re- i mean the ingredients themselves are found in archaeological sites so anyone who anyone else wants to say something i just um uh... Recently, I was doing this research in Odisha where I saw this plant called Kia, K-I-A, mm-hmm. uh, which in Hindi, we call it Keuda. Uh, it's a flower um, mm-hmm. uh, which transported to Delhi and they make used to make perfume. And mm-hmm. that plant, uh, normally, it's a natural barrier near the coast of Bay Bengal, which hold the tree, you know, hold the land uh, against mm-hmm. uh, land erosion. And that flower mm-hmm. comes and that Uh, so now they have started cultivating that flower, I think. But when mm-hmm. I was doing this research, I found there is a pigeon uh, struggle, resistance against corporate uh, companies. Not long back in the 90s, when Tata Company, one of the big companies, they wanted to grab that land. To, mm-hmm. I think. So it was interesting for me to think about that perfume. But I have never heard, like smelled Keuda perfume myself. But mm-hmm. I found this grand history of regis- people's resistance. which is much mm-hmm. more loaded than this flower which become a perfume no mm-hmm. so it was always for me this people's resistance this issue this corporate government and all then there is this flower which has a perfume which is you know everybody you don't even can smell it so mm-hmm. that, that's very interesting i think but anyway rikka rikku rik uh yes Hi. Um, so I have a oh, electricity in Beirut has just come back on. <laughs> uh, I have a, a, a sort of methodological question, which is, so the way you've been presenting the material is, is sort of um, kind of historicist. I mean, I understand that you're trying to build up a, uh, you know, between the, the, the art record and you're trying to build up a, a, a record of practices and cultural practices. Um, um, can you... can you have you thought about the the kind of curatorial aspect of of this uh, in terms of presentation um at the, at the moment it sounds like a, a kind of historical research um is have so this is this is just a question have you have you thought about the kind of curatorial aspect or or is that um, or not really um i have thought about like how it would translate in like if it was to be an exhibition like how would that exhibition look like how would it feel like uh what are the objects that will be shown uh what types of objects will be presented um and i think about it when i want to evade the writing part of the dissertation uh but i mean it's just been like fragmented thoughts like nothing really that i would say um i've never really built a proposal or um it's just ideas that come to mind of 
how how these objects could come to life or how it could it could be disseminated or how can the story be disseminated to an exhibition in an exhibition to an audience uh to an art audience or and yeah but uh, because it's interesting you know, the the, answer, but... <laughs> no, no, but that's that's really that's that's exactly the question uh the uh this conversation is incredibly evocative, right? I mean, just we're, we're all sitting around and talking about it, and yet I, I feel as though I'm I'm there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, it's uh, so smell isn't only about, you know, I mean, smell is great when you're experiencing, but it's also incredibly evocative in in and of itself. Um, just to add a, a, a you know a completely ridiculous little comment on the side, but I remember a long time ago there was a, a John Waters movie. You know, the experimental filmmaker. Uh, I can't remember which movie it was, but when you went into the cinema, he handed out these little cards that were called Scratch and Smell. Uh, mm -hmm. And they had numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, five. And then suddenly when the number uh, appeared on the screen, you scratched it and it would be things like, you know, mama's cooking in the kitchen or the new car smell or, or something like that when somebody got into a new car. That's just, I'm, I'm not suggesting anything like that, but that's just the, uh, it just uh, occurred to me as, you know, how do you deal with smell? Right. in a yeah. in a material sense it's not yeah. not easy to do All right thanks no there's um i mean one when you mentioned scratch and smell um the i mean growing up with publications or arabic sort of cult pop culture publications you would have little perfume samples that you could scratch and, and smell uh, but even um there was one article in the aa files i mean this has nothing to do with uh, this uh, conversation, but um, Tom Weaver, who was the editor then, had a piece on Philip Johnson's Glass House and wanted to evoke the, uh, he was the editor, I don't know who wrote the piece, but uh, I don't remember who wrote the piece, and there was a scratch and sniff of the scent of leather. Uh, hey, right, right, exactly. His Glass House with smelled like, so I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> a note to remember. If it's yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> for a publication. Share <laughs> with. Yeah, I was I, I was tempted to ask. Also, I think sort of met some somewhat methodological question because it is a really it's a really interesting puzzle, you know, to think about. Um, but I wonder, and this is just a short in the dark suggestion. I wonder if. Um, because I know in like, you know, with, with uh, you know, uh, especially uh, psychoanalytic theory, like partial objects, like, like the voice, right, or, or, or the gaze, right, it's studied through, um, through uh, uh, you know, through, through uh, the sort of failure to attain, right, um, mm -hmm. that sort of perfect vision that you're supposed to, to get. So that's the separation of the, of the look and the gaze, right, or, um, you know, speech and and the voice uh, object, which you can't really, in a one to one correspondence way. There's going to be an echo, right? There's going to be some sort of failure or disturbance that registers the persistence of the object, right? Um, the partial object, voice, gaze, in your case, sense, right? Mm -hmm. The the persistence of the partial. So this, I'm not sure if this is one way to sort of um, think about this, even uh, like analytically at a methodological level. Um, you're right that like one way to I mean it's impossible to try and come up with a universal scent um, that wouldn't be you know that that would be historical um, you know and 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 accurate because there's so much subjectivity to it but I wonder if there's like if you came across any sort of like failures in abilities to smell in the ways in which smell was anticipated in your research right like um, um oh this doesn't smell um, foul in the way in the way in which it's supposed to smell foul or this doesn't smell good in the way that it's supposed to smell good or this isn't poisoning me or you know through smelling it or this isn't poisoning the person um, um so uh, that negative um approach to especially trippy the very tricky phenomenon you're you're you're, you're very nicely dealing with you know um and this again i see this with voice sight um uh, uh touch you know Sex, sexuality, like, um, you know, um, nothing quite works um, um, with regards to the one-to-one -one correspondence of two bodies of, 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 uh, of or bodies of, of um, uh, vision of, of, there's always a blind spot of sound. So just a question on this sense, not that I'm trying to fetishize you as a scent expert or something, but you are doing this great work, so. Um, no, in terms of failures or, or foul sense, the, I, 
I remade three recipes and they, they were all gross. Like they were all quite smelly and, uh, and foul. Um, but the text didn't, I mean, they weren't meant to be perfume that you wear or scent that you wear. Um, it's just that scent is part of this process of production or um, uh, producing recipes to heal, producing recipes to sort of clean, uh, uh, recipes to mend. Um, and scent is a factor that comes into play. So it's not, it's not highlighted uh, per se in the books. They're not, um, uh, again, only the book of on poison um, really sort of categorizes it as its own section. Uh, whereas um, in the other recipes, I really have to decide, uh, sort of unpack it or, um, or highlight uh, where the term is used uh, or where fragrance is sort of alluded to. Um, and in one of these sort of moments, I guess, um, um, recipes that pertain to hygiene are meant to be fragrant. Uh, so that's a moment where I guess scent doesn't fail. And um, moments where there are recipes to sort of um, um, not clean, but uh, what's the right word? To sort of spread within a space or to clean the floors of the courts or uh, that are meant to sort of evoke a particular um, feeling. And for me, this project is really to try and, um, and pick on the, the tangible elements of scent, because like, even as we're talking about it now, it feels like this thing that we don't understand, or it's hard to sort of pin down in terms of descriptors, but it's, uh, it's chemistry. Uh, it's measured, it's calculated, it's clear, there's value, uh, or it's devalued, um, and, um, I think that's the way I'm trying to go about it. But you bring up, Rohit, uh, important problematics that I think we'll now sit with, <laughs> that I'll sit with for a while. So thank you. Fascinating talk. Thank you. There is one question from uh, Mira Almazuri. Yeah, it's my sister. She has no <laughs> business writing in the text. Thinking <laughs> about the wolf spin. Wool spinners, did you find a correlation and materials or ingredients that are harder to obtain and their benefits? Uh, sorry, what was the first Think, part? Thinking, the first about the, thinking about the wool spinners, did mm -hmm. you find a correlation with materials or ingredients that are harder to obtain and their benefits? Uh, yes, there were um, ingredients that were either sourced and traded or listed even in the Geniza manuscripts as, um, with their exact value. So we're very much aware of, um, or I mean, it's documented, uh, the types of ingredients that... Um, um, that the question I posed. Um, yeah, they're... So ingredients that were harder to obtain uh, were often, again, in terms of quantity. So myrrh and frankincense, um, even though close regionally, they were grown in Amman or, um, or, or Yemen, um, were taken from the sap of the trees, which were, was also deemed precious because both of these ingredients uh, were used um, in religious, uh, like part of, part of the sort of religious processions. And um, so they were valued. Um, so that was a direct co correlation. And then there are um, other ingredients that are specific to um, Nepal, uh, like musk, uh, that was valued um, differently and also treated differently within the recipe, um, within sort of the hierarchy of materials that could be used. Um, and what other ingredients? Then a lot of sort of the more vegetal ingredients were, I've come to learn, um, were 
new agricultural sites or banks uh, were invested in. Um, so even if they were traded uh, over time, uh, began to grow around the Mediterranean basin. So there was this continuity of uh, moving, um, yeah, moving ingredients. And um, I hope that answers your question, Mira. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, I don't know about Arabic, is it, uh, does that language uh, differentiate male and female, like, uh, like, I don't know how to say it, uh, like in Hindi, you'll say bus is a female, a truck is a male, so does Arabic, the, like, it has similar, uh... yes, yeah, okay, so, uh, when you talk about gender thing, uh, do you think uh, this perfume also has gender, like male perfume for the male and female and all? Or there's no reference as such? Uh, I mean, there were not the perfume, but uh, to address particular ailment, ailments that were, uh, that were specific to women, uh, that was when it was addressed. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily in scent, like gendered, uh, gendered recipes were not, uh, did, I mean, I haven't come across it, to be quite honest. Anyone else? Uh, hi, I have, I, have, I have something else to add to that. Can I go ahead? Yeah, of course. Um, so, um, you know, talking about that question of uh, gendered, um, you know, gendered ingredients. So all of this, um, so this Arab, uh, Arabic, going back to Dioscorides, it goes back further to the late antique, um, <clears throat> into the antique uh, time period. Um, all of it essentially goes back to Aristotle, mm -hmm. uh, essentially. And Aristotle um, divides things, the natural world, divides them up into something like the humors, right? So there are, you know, hot and dry things and uh, cold and wet things. Yeah. And, and so much medicine is about balancing out those, those kind of being, those elements within the body. So if you, if the balance falls out, then you get ill and then you take in these various things. So um, yeah. it's, it's interesting if you, so the question is, have you come across that in the Arabic literature, literature, because if it isn't there, I'd be really surprised. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the the question. Yeah, no, the balance comes into play, and I think that's where it's borrowed a lot from Persian and Sanskrit books as well, and they merge together. Is that the the care for your for the exterior of your body is, has equal sort of weight as the interior, um, in a sense that there is this need to balance um, your external well-being with uh, your internal, or there was there wasn't that distinction to begin with. It was seen as one. Um, yeah, exactly. And that's um, and that's where it comes through in the text. So, so that's a real that's a real medieval feature, right? Because I mean, it goes through all the way in the uh, certainly in, in the Byzantine medieval tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so everything in the kind of Eastern Mediterranean and then heading for the East all, all participate in that same sort of worldview about balances of these kind of essential mm -hmm. elements that are configured in, in the world mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. And they change, like, they're not always Aristotelian, but they're always, somehow that basic structural principle is, is always in play. Exactly. Yeah. Like Thanks. you had to care for both to be a functioning human and society. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. That's, yeah, exactly right. Exactly. Lena, you want to ask? Yeah, Lena. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much, Meta, for your presentation. It was really great. And while you were presenting, I was thinking really a lot of, um, you know, the, your preoccupation with questions about also like how do we retranslate and rewrite um, what do we understand of scent? Um, and um, last week I met Rico and uh, in Beirut while I was there and um, I was telling him about a plant that it's called polarium or like sweet scented plant we call it a latra mm -hmm. uh, 
And I, growing up, like, you know, spending summers in Lebanon, in Mount Lebanon, I grew up around that plant. So mm -hmm. I was very surprised. It was like a few hours before I met Rico when I found this plant in Beirut near the sea. And it it struck me because the scent, before I looked, I saw the plant. I, like, I smelled the scent of that plant. And I turned around and I saw this plant um, really growing in a huge amount of, let's say, uh, quantity. And it struck me because um, it made me wonder, like, how with the current, like, multiple crisis in, I mean, in Lebanon specifically, in Beirut, environmental, economic, and so on, it made me wonder about how this plant migrated to, um, you know, the, the, the capital, Beirut. Mm -hmm. And um, as well as it made me wonder about, like, perhaps if there is like a medicinal, um, you know, a, a reason why this is there, how would actually non-human, let's say, um, you know, species around this plant interact with the scent? And uh, your presentation is kind of like provoking this. Um, I, mean, I don't have a question, but it's just like made me wonder about this experience that I had and I shared it with Rico and also she, Rico is uh, sharing a similar, um, you know, uh, experience, but not specifically to the, the hierarchy of scent because obviously throughout time, um, you know, um, those who build on knowledge and choose to kind of preserve scent, preserve what is important and what is not. Um, I'm sure certain scents, like scents, have disappeared or some scents reappeared, which mm -hmm. is in this fact in Beirut today. Yeah. You have this plant that is associated with the mountain, it's associated now with the sea. And actually, I, I took a small part and got it with me here in Vienna and just to kind of like see how this uh, scent will develop in this environment. And there you go. You're part of the migrant. I mean, you're also, uh, you're making it sort of appear in a different place. But I think you, you point at a lot of uh, questions that I haven't been able to answer, which is, um, and a lot of scholars that I read or the secondary material that I'm looking at um, try to kind of parse through, which is, um, do the ingredients travel or do the seeds travel? Um, it, does Do these books travel or does the knowledge, do people carry the knowledge and like there, there's a lot of like what moves and what stays and what is carried through. And um, I, I mean, it takes a lot of close reading and maybe just uh, mapping or one genealogy of one particular book uh, to really kind of extract this information, if at all, if it's at all possible. Uh, but yeah, you, you point at... Uh, sort of you you painted a beautiful photo or picture of uh, how how elements migrate and how their importance comes into play and I think ask uh, ask people what if they use it at all in um, uh, Al you said that's the name of the plant Al which is I will write it here in the chat this is like a scientific name but, um, yeah, yeah I mean, you can ask to see if there was a historical use or a recent use or um, why it fell out. I mean, yeah, there, I think oral histories are important there. Um, from my, like, you know, um, let's say from my mom's side, it's been passed on into like, it has this medicine effect for people, you know, um, you know, it helps with a lot of like body pains and, and anxiety sometimes, so all of these kind of things. And it was just interesting that this kind of popped up around other plants, you know? And so sometimes, um, obviously like the general knowledge of how do we act or how do we want to kind of benefit from, um, how do we drink tea, for example? What does it bring to us as well? And I think your presentation puts this perspective on the scent in relation to other species as well. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll write it down in the chat uh, section now. Uh, can I can I just add to the story that uh, that as as Lena was telling me the story, 
in this cafe we were, where we were sitting, we, we had a tea uh, that neither of us had ever heard of before, right? It was another one of those herbs with a name I can't quite remember it now, but just, just to show how, um, how, how broad and constantly moving this field is and how impossible it is to kind of put your, you know, put your finger on it. I was surprised when, when the guy brought the tea that Lena that you had not heard of it, having, you know, having spent time here in Beirut. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, I have, uh, um, I, I have a, a, another comment to add about, you know, you're saying, how do these things travel? And is it just the knowledge that travels? Is it the books that travel? So as someone who's worked in the medieval period for a long time, um, and I've followed these debates and questions about, you know, within the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, for what happens to traditions and various artistic traditions. And the answer is things always travel much, much more than you would ever have expected. And they always travel through routes that you, you know, that, that, that somehow knowledge of something pops up always in some strange place. Um, and so that's essentially a, a, a verbal tradition, right? That's, that, gets, that gets passed along. I've never read a paper in all the years I've been doing this. I've never read a paper where somebody said, oh, we thought that it spread, but we were wrong. It hadn't spread, right? Every paper is, we thought they didn't know about it, but in fact, really everybody knew about it all the time. Uh, so that's my, my overall answer to your question about passing through the text. Stuff always travels much more quickly than you might imagine. Yeah. And needs emerge at the same time as well, I think, in multiple locations. So that's... Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the, the answers to those needs, you know, it, it, that's the chicken and egg question, right? Which is, does the product create the need? Does the need demand the product? But they happen, these things are responded to so quickly. And if you think about it in terms of, you know, a Silk Road travel, we think, oh, you know, it traveled so slowly, but it, it's a matter of weeks. You know, it's a matter of weeks, maybe months from one end of the West to the other end of the East. Things always travel amazingly quickly. Um, Tima, um, Tima yeah, yeah, Tima's question. She's asking if these recipes, specifically Ibn Rashiyah's uh, recipes, if they were halal or if they were seen as problematic or supernatural. Um, I don't know about halal, but the, his recipes were... Um, pro I mean, they were prominent. They were they were made available. How many people sort of had access to the books on poison specifically? I'm on uh, I'm unaware of. Uh, but um, these recipes were intended to kill or inflict uh, a lot of pain on the person uh, receiving it. So. Um, and they were not seen as supernatural or otherworldly because uh, they were so material in their uh, in their process. They were so real in their uh, application, and and even if a few required um, the preparation to be at a specific time of sort of uh, uh, within the lunar um, form. Uh, it was still seen as science, or I think at least how it's documented and consolidated as a type of science and not as um, a supernatural or a mythical um, um, mythical knowledge. Uh, but I'm not sure on the halal part. Um, I haven't read anything that sort of counters or disputes uh, the circulation um, of these books, but it could just be that I haven't come across it, not that it's not um, there. Yeah, thank you. It's interesting how every issue becomes human issue uh, because we travel, we migrate. So, and then at the end, I'm just uh, realizing that everything becomes uh, issue related to environment. So, yeah, in, like I don't have anything to say. No, but thank you, Pari. You've, uh, you've brought up such inquisitive kind of questions and threads. Um, everyone has- One other thing, Meta. sorry if you don't mind, because it's again tempting, but th this uh, this last conversation with Lina and Rico and Alpari, um, I think it's a wild mess in my house, um, but, but has just um, alerted me to, you should also, and I actually asked Lina, I think, to, to, to have a look at this when she was in Beirut, but uh, it, we became fashionable for those who were in Lebanon studying this, for just a little bit of time because it was really difficult to get but he was a scent maker dr dehesh who was um 
oddly affiliated with uh, uh, Bashar al-Khodi's family. Um, and like there are lots of rumors around De- Dr. Dehesh, his potions, his sense in particular. And uh, Bashar al-Khodi is a, a, you know, sort of um, a, a, a killing. And um, there's like a massive Dehesh society still, like in, now it's in New York. Um, uh, his house is still in Lebanon, but um, he he thought sent. He was almost like a material mesmerist. If you, I don't know if you know anything about the mesmerists. They were like right before the the French Revolution, basically. Like mesmerism became, and this was actually that famous David, uh, uh, the death of uh, Marat, that famous uh, modernist painting you know, that was that was walked through the streets of of, of Paris after the. The, the the revolution, the French Revolution. Um, he was a mesmerist, and basically, it was non-material understandings of um, of of not scent, but sense. Like you could, there was like a, a, a fluid, and it's sort of like this Durkheimian mana. There's this fluid in bodies that um, would just like a reiki, like um, putting your hands on, mm-hmm. not touching, but above bodies. Um, mm-hmm. You could demagnetize it, so you could let the fluid flow not just within the body but across bodies as well um and Dehesh like tried to do something very similar for sense and uh again lots of lots of rumors but um but it could be it could be interesting just to think a little contemporarily you know with with yeah. um, these efforts as well I know you are already but just uh, no, no, another weird you. story no thank you for the reference I I'll definitely look into it <laughs> Very generous of you. Yeah, anybody else? Last question. Do we have time? Or... So should we call it today? I don't know, like how to. Sure. Call yeah, it. I did. We're not no quantitative stipulation. It's you know so. Yeah. If, if, just depending on the questions and then they first.